Good morning. This is Patty Gray with the Office of Outreach and Communications at the Department of Education. Welcome to today's webcast on the Science Revised Standards and Model Curriculum. Before we begin the presentation, there are just a few housekeeping items. Uh, there are a lot of you that are still joining us on the call. We have muted all phones. So the way that you can enter a question is through the chat box. You are seeing uh, the presentation as a full screen, but in the very top left corner, you will see a box that says chat. There is a plus sign. If you click on the plus sign, you will get a drop-down box, and you can enter your question there. Please feel free to enter questions as they occur to you during the presentation. Due to the large number of people on this webinar, we will not be opening up the audio phone. So all questions we do ask you to submit through the chat box. You will not see all the questions uh, that are being entered, but the presenters do. And if we do not answer a question today, know that it will inform the Q&As that will be developed after this webinar. We will answer as many as time permits. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on the ODE website when it is available, which should be within this week, we will send an email message to everybody who registered uh, through STARS that it is now posted. Finally, you will get an email message either this afternoon or tomorrow morning with a very brief online survey that we would appreciate you giving us feedback on how the webinar works and how the um, technology and any suggestions that you have for us so that we can improve future communications with you. Now it is my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Kathy Holmes, Education Consultant with the Center for Curriculum and Assessment. Kathy? Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, an email was sent this morning which provided two documents that we will be using today. If you did not receive that email, I'm going to talk you through where to go on the web to receive those documents. If you go to the ODE webpage and under the Educator column, click on Academic Content Standards and then go to the side and click on Science. When you get to the Science home. If you go down to the third selection under the revised science standards and model curriculum, you will see materials for the targeted professional development series that we are doing. It is from here that you can get the two documents that we are going to use. When you click on that, you can go to the very bottom under the targeted professional development focus one and click to pick up the information about the scavenger hunt. It's a one-page document with five questions on it. We will walk through this. If you don't get this for this presentation, that is okay. We will talk about the questions. And again, after this webinar, you can go and look in more detail. The other document that you will need will be under focus session two. And that will be then the cognitive demand document. We will talk about that in detail in just a moment. I also want to take a few moments to capture what the goal of this session is. The Ohio Department of Education is conducting a series of professional development throughout the state divided into two focus sessions. The first one concentrated on the organization of the model curriculum. It was introduced via a scavenger hunt, which you will get a preview to and have an opportunity to walk through. The second session is about cognitive demand and how to incorporate that in classroom instruction. This is the focus of this particular presentation. We know that there's a lot of new things on the horizon which raise a lot of questions, questions about assessment, questions about teacher evaluation, extended standards, and a lot of things that will fall beyond the scope of this presentation. 
Again, the focus of this is the revised science standards and model curriculum, the organization of the model curriculum, what resources are available that support the model curriculum, and where you can go to find them and how to use them. When we look at science education, there are two goals that we have in mind. One is to help to develop and inform a very well-versed workforce, and also to develop scientifically literate citizens. All students should have sufficient understanding of scientific knowledge and scientific processes to enable them to distinguish what is science from what isn't science, to be able to make clear decisions about career choices, health decisions for themselves and their family, also quality of life decisions and other decisions that not only impact them but other folks too. This is important because we are preparing students for an entirely new world. Most of the jobs that students will have during their lifetimes haven't even been thought of yet. We need to prepare our students to be able to access and acquire new skills and knowledge to prepare for this new reality. Anything less is doing them a great disservice. When we look at what we want students to know and to be able to do, we want them to have scientific knowledge of certain important facts, concepts, and theories. We want them to be able to exercise the scientific ha habits of mind. And it, and, excuse me, an understanding of the nature of science, its connections to mathematics and technology, impact on individuals, and its role in society. The, being able to engage in scientific issues and being able to communicate that with a variety of audiences are all important aspects of what we hope to prepare students to do with our revised standards and model curriculum. When we look at what we ask from the state level as far as courses, we have the Ohio Core in Science, which says that students will have three units of inquiry-based laboratory experience that engages students in asking valid scientific questions and gathering information. In the law, we ask that these three units are laboratory-based. Does it change the time that currently exists? We have many questions that say, well, how many hours does that need to occur? It is the same as it's always been. It can be 150 hours, which we term a scientific lab laboratory course, or it can be 120 hours, which is a non-laboratory course. But the type of instruction that occurs in both of those requires students conducting investigations, asking questions, um, being able to analyze data, draw conclusions on that, and be able to relay that to a variety of audiences. There are three units that are expected, one in physical science, one in life science, and one in an advanced area of study as the 11th or 12th grade. And you have that list in front of you. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an opportunity to see what types of courses would be accepted to meet the Ohio Corps. Before we look at what is changing or what's being rebuilt through the revised standards and model curriculum, we want to take a moment to look at what's the same. If in any of our presentations through the Ohio Department of Ed for Science, we always talk about the learning cycle. We use it in reference to inquiry. And the new terminology we're starting to use is scientific practices. Scientific practices in the learning cycle. You have the content, which is the core of what you do, but you engage students in a variety of ways of learning that information. It's not just lecture and drill and kill with worksheets or a cookbook lab. You encourage students to ask questions and to devise investigations to solve problems. They use a variety of scientific tools to collect information and data which needs to be analyzed. They can use that data to compare to national and scientific research-based analysis databases where they can evaluate what's going on, compare what's going on in the community, what's being done nationally, and what's being done globally. It gives them an opportunity to draw conclusions on that, 
communicate it to a variety of audiences, and then think about how would I do things differently. All of these things have been part of scientific instruction all along the way. As we start to move into the model curriculum, we try to find ways to build on this. So this is the foundation, but we continue to build and move forward. Again, scientific practices are the core of the revised science standards. When you think about it, it's demonstrating science knowledge. Students must be encouraged to think and act in ways associated with inquiry, including asking questions, planning and conducting investigations, using appropriate tools and techniques to gather and organize data, thinking critically and logically about relationships between evidence and explanations, constructing and analyzing alternative explanations, and communicating scientific arguments to a variety of audiences, authentic audiences, so that they tie into local resources and local um, concerns so that they can make changes in their own backyards. One of the major focuses of the revised standards is making those real-world applications where they tie into what's going on in their communities and in their backyards. One of the ways to think about doing scientific practices is an I wonder circle. This is particularly effective for younger students. A lot of times we think about scientific practices as the scientific method, a list of steps to follow in a particular order. But science really doesn't work that way. It's more like this diagram where there are certain activities that are common to scientific investigations, but that order may not always be in a particular sequence. As we do things and make discoveries, sometimes that takes us back to posing more questions. It might not necessarily confirm what we thought our hypothesis may be. So we make observations, it raises questions. We try something else, it raises other questions. It makes us think about things a little bit differently. Again, this I wonder circle is very nice for the earlier elementary grades. And as we start to move into high school, we can make it a little bit more complex where we ask specific questions and students, again, same steps, but thinking about it in a little different way, making observations, defining problems, forming a research question, investigating or researching what we're looking at data, carrying out that research, examining the results, reflecting on findings, and then communicating that with others. As we move through this process, we often find that we're left with more questions than we have answers. And students need to know that's how the real world works. That's what's going to happen as you do these investigations. And it then gives them opportunities to delve deeper into the content. When we look at our revised standards and model curriculum, there are several things that we really want students to do. We want them to engage in problem-based or project-based learning, which really ties into those real-world applications. So they're actually getting an opportunity to engage and investigate and to solve various problems or design various things. And this, this helps to prepare students for performance-based assessment so that they're able to think about a particular project and plan a series or a methodology to approach it to perform a specific task and utilize the scientific habits of mind that need to come into place as we do these investigations. So those are the goals so that they're making those real world applications, doing real problems, real projects, something that's connected to the real world. Taking a switch here, where are the revised standards and model curriculum, where do you find them? This is the exercise that we um, utilize in the Targeted Professional Development 1, which you can find on the web in its entirety with the PowerPoint presentation that goes through the entire presentation with the handouts that are associated with this as well as um, activities that help to reinforce what we want done with the model curriculum. But we walk you through where to find it. When you go to the home page, you see under educators, you go under academic content standards and click there. 
Once there, you go to the left-hand side, scroll down to Science. If you click there, then you go to the new Science Education Standards and Model Curriculum. I believe now it currently says Revise. That's the page where you're going to get all the information and all of the things that you're going to need. As we post new things, that's what's going to be on there. I'm going to walk you through the list of things that are there to help to inform how to use the model curriculum, what's there, and also give you a preview of what's coming. The first two bullets, the first is a podcast, which kind of gives you the history behind the development of the model curriculum and the standards and how to use them. Underneath there is an MP4, which walks you through an illustration of being a seventh grade teacher. How do I approach using this document? What am I going to find in this document? How is this different than the green book? And how do I approach using this information and incorporating it into a lesson? It walks you through the content statement and elaboration, how to read it, how to use the visions into practice, how to use the data sources that are attached to that, as well as tying it into other disciplines through the eye of integration. All of that is um, provided for you in that illustration. Again, that's live on the website. You're welcome to go and look at that. Underneath you will find then the revised academic content standards and model curriculum. There's an overview that gives you kind of the big picture of what's going on in the document. The next two are divided into grades pre-K through 8 and also then the high school. Those are two separate documents. They're PDF forms. We will go through the parts and pieces of that in just a moment. You also have topics at a glance for the pre-K through 8, which gives you an opportunity to see what the sequencing of content areas are, helps to highlight the learning progressions, and helps you to plan for who does what in the series as you move through. There's also a section for frequently asked questions, as well as examples for the eye of integration. You'll also see on here some of our tools, the comparative analysis, which is an analysis that compares the 2002 document with our current 2010 document. There's also a crosswalk for pre-K through 12, which again gives you topic similarities between the two documents. It also highlights what's moved. And then you are directed then to go back into the model curriculum and read the changes that have occurred. There's a resource filter on there that also helps you to think about the types of activities and resources that you wish to employ as you start to implement the uh, model curriculum and the content standards. And there will be a survey coming that will be posted in the next few weeks which will give you an opportunity to give us feedback on what you've tried in the model curriculum, what's working for you, what's not working for you, what you found that could also help to um, inform teachers on how to instruct this content. This next section is a walk through the scavenger hunt. If you have that document, you might want to take it out. There are five questions on here. When teachers run through this activity, they're going to want to have either an electronic copy or a hard copy of the model curriculum both for high school and for the pre-K through 8. Um, it will give them an opportunity to get a feel for the organization. This particular activity is just a very quick, dirty glance of how to evaluate and think about what's in the model curriculum. We also have um, on the web an opportunity to go a little bit deeper. So if you want to take that a little bit further, again, go back to the web under the Targeted Professional Development Session 1. But here we will walk through these first five questions. When you First, open up the model curriculum for the pre-K through 8. This is what you see. Each of the titles is a hyperlink to that portion of the document, which will take you through all of that particular grade. When you click on the high school, it has a slightly different look to it. It is done by the discrete courses. 
It's not done by grade level, so it again has a very different feel to it. You'll see uh, course syllabi outlined with the content statements versus what you'll see in pre-K through 8. And we'll again talk about that in just a moment. The first question of the scavenger hunt asks you to name the three strands of the Ohio Revised Science Standards and Model Curriculum. Well, when you look through, and you're going to invite your teachers to go through the document and find this, and this can be found in the topics at a glance, you will see that the Standards are divided up into three strands. They're the traditional strands we've had before, the earth and space science, physical science, and life science. We've cut down the six that were in the 2002 document to three. The next question of the model of the scavenger hunt asks to identify, read, and highlight the three grade band themes title and description for pre-K through 2, 3 through 5, 6 through 8, and also then ask what is the significance of this organization. On the sides of the topic at a glance, you can see where we have the observations of the environment. Underneath it, then, you have the interconnections and sy with systems, which focuses on exploring how components of a system are related using scientific inquiry. And finally, in the grades 6 through 8, you have order and organization, which focuses on discovering patterns, trends, and relationships within or between systems using scientific inquiry. Each one of these has a particular focus that's carried out through all those grades in all of those different strands. And as you read through the model curriculum, you'll see those connections coming together very nicely. Question number three, what grade bands have the same science inquiry and application expectations? This is where the process standards are. We had six before, we put them down to three, but now that we have the three, we need to talk about those scientific processes because they're not lost. They're now integrated in a different way. And we've divided them up into three different grade bands, a little different than the themes, and they continue to build upon each other throughout the year. In pre-K through four, you see, as you read along in the model curriculum, those particular inquiry and application skills where they're doing observations, they're asking questions, they're doing great appropriate investigations, they're using great appropriate tools to figure out how to collect data, drawing conclusions, and then communicating their results with others. And you'll see that those skills build as we move into grades 5 and 8, and finally in grades 9 through 12. Those same skills are also there. When you look in the high school document, it's placed in a little bit differently. This would be that 9 through 12 illustration. In each course in the high school, you have that division of science inquiry and applications that give you the kind of the big points of things that will be interwoven through all of the content areas. When we look at the specific grade levels, and we pick grade 5 as an illustration here, we go to the next question on the um, scavenger hunt. Let's, I think I skipped number four. Let me go back. Looking at the biology syllabus and model curriculum high school, how does the science inquiry and applications compare to this section in the pre-K through eight? I answered the question, but I didn't bring it up in the conversation. Again, they're building on the skills as you walk through the years and go through the grade bands. It's the same expectation all the way through, but the skills become more complex as you get to the high school level. And then finally, question number five in the scavenger hut. What three sections are present in the content elaborations for grades one through eight? In all of the content elaborations are for pre-K through eight, high school is a little bit different story, but all of the components are still there. You'll see the content which is in the shaded area. It's gray in your documents. In the um, illustration here, it's blue. The content statement tells you what the focus is for that grade level. And underneath there, there's a short description. And then you have, under the content elaborations, three sections. The first section talks about prior concepts coming 
into this grade level about this particular content. It tells you what grades they were introduced and the depth at which it was talked about. So you're highlighting what needs to be talked about going into this conversation. So what students are coming to you with. Then we get into the meat of that particular content statement, which provides you the parameter. It introduces the content limits as well as the skills that need to be presented for this content at this grade level. And if there's any particular notes that need to be added in this section, this is where you'll find that. They'll give you notes on how to handle particular topics within science. For example, how do you handle mass versus weight? There's a conversation about that. You would click a link and it takes you then to national research to base your um, instruction on. There's a lot of different tips in there, you'll see highlighted links throughout there which help to inform the instruction for this level. Also then you will see future applications of concepts. So what this content for this grade level is building towards. So that gives you the parameters of what you need to concentrate in this particular content statement at this grade level. That wraps up targeted professional development session one. The scavenger hunt goes through all of that. Now we're changing, turning our attention to the second focus for the targeted professional development, the cognitive demand. When we look at cognitive demands, there is a, this is the second sheet that you can use that, again, we talked about retrieving at the very beginning. These four cognitive demands are interwoven in all of the content for all grade levels and all content areas in high school. You have designing technological engineering solutions using science concepts. We have the, a letter T for the abbreviation. Demonstrating science knowledge, D. Interpreting and communicating science concepts C and recalling accurate science. On the handout, we have detailed definitions for each one of these. This can be considered the power page that goes with every single content statement or content elaboration in the entire document. At all levels, you should be trying to incorporate all four of these cognitive demands. This is what the handout looks like. This gives you an illustration of the four different cognitive demands with their descriptions. Let's take a moment to look at them in a little bit more detail. The first one, designing technological engineering solutions using science concepts. It's, it is essential that designing engineering and technological solutions be linked to the content in the model curriculum. Students must be given the opportunity to analyze engineering problems, propose and test solutions, and anticipate the consequences of proposed solutions. They need to be able to communicate, critique, and evaluate different alternative solutions. This is a little bit different than what we've done. We've probably just tapped on the surface of this, but we need to get a little deeper. If you're familiar with the 2003 standards technology, you might recognize this diagram from their standards from 2003. This highlights the design process, which is the foundation for the technology standards. But you'll notice that there's, it, it moves in a, in, a, in a circular motion, but we don't have numbers associated with it. It's not a step-by-step -step process. Again, it is very much like those I wonder wheels that I showed you earlier where you can go back and forth in this process. It's not necessarily a step-by-step -step process because as students start to work through and put something together, they might hit a snag or a block that makes them rethink and refocus and have to go back and reinvestigate what's going on and then draw other conclusions, try other scenarios, evaluate what's working, what's not working, what might need to be done differently, better. So it's an opportunity to think about it in a variety of ways. Um, much of the technological activity is oriented towards designing and creating new products, 
technological systems and environments. When we think about this type of design process, it involves the application of knowledge into new situations or goals that often result in the development of new knowledge. The processes are those actions that people undertake to create, invent, design, transform, produce, control, maintain or use products or systems. The process includes the human activities of designing and developing technological systems, determining and controlling the behavior of technological systems, utilizing those systems, and assessing the impact of those usages. So this is what we're going for in this particular cognitive demand. The next is demonstrating science knowledge, also known as inquiry, using the new terminology, thinking about it as scientific practices. This is where students do investigations. This is not about a cookbook lab where kids go through the steps, the bell goes off, the solution changes color, but they're looking at their environment, they're asking questions about a particular topic, they're designing their own investigations to figure out how to solve that problem, they're collecting data, they're making decisions based on that data, and they're able then to communicate that information to others. This is demonstrating, this is inquiry. This is our new scientific practices, if you want to think about it in that way. The other is interpreting and communi communicating science concepts. This is where we get data and we analyze it to see what's going on. We use scientific facts and theories to determine what's going on in a particular experiment in an investigation, and we draw conclusions on this. Um, this is what teachers do all the time. Um, this is one of our more comfortable levels. This is do you understand the phenomena behind the science, and are you able to explain what's going on and why, given a particular scenario or real-world data set to be able to think about, analyze, and draw conclusions. And then finally, we have recalling accurate science, which includes those scientific facts, figures, concepts, and relationships. <clears throat> we also include in this um, performing a routine task. We use mathematics as an example here, but knowing how to use a microscope would be an example of a recalling accurate science cognitive demand task. We've got a lot of information here to process. How do you put it all together? What do you do with all of the pieces? I'm going to walk through a grade four physical science example of how to do this. When you think about the cognitive demands, they shouldn't be taught in isolation. They should be incorporated as a whole, as one complete instructional task. If we take this content statement that energy can be transformed from one form to another or can be transferred from one location to another, we look at the content description that goes along with that. Electric circuits require a complete loop of conducting materials through which electrical energy can be transferred. When we go to the model curriculum into our visions into practice section, we can see classroom illustrations of these. There are four practices or four examples that are related to each one of the cognitive demands that we just walked through. When we look at the designing technological engineering solutions using science concepts, we see that the task is to design and construct a switch that can turn a light on and off in a circuit. When we go to demonstrating scientific knowledge, we see that the task then says to build a circuit that contains two light bulbs or analyze the difference between working and non-working circuits to determine patterns and trends in the experimental evidence. When we move over to interpreting and communicating science concepts, we can see that we can then pictorially represent a working circuit. What's working, what's not? Looking at a picture, does it work, does it not work? 
And then finally, in recalling accurate science, we recognize that a working circuit requires a continuous loop of electrical con connections or conductions where everything's connected, the wire completes a complete electrical circuit. Now, we don't treat those all as separate entities. You can teach that concept as a whole, starting with the demonstrating where you give kids light bulbs, you give them wires, and you have them sit down and think about what's going on. How do we do a circuit? You have kids make it work, and you're going to have a variety of different ways that students do that. You're going to have some that have one configuration, another set of kids will have another configuration, another set of kids that don't know how to make it work. So you have them put all of the things together and then start to talk about what's the same between all of these. What's different? For the ones that work, why do they work? Why did, why does, why did these two different configurations work? When you, but when you do this with that, it does not. And have them talk through and be able to explain why it works, why it doesn't, what's going on with that whole process. So we're not starting with a circuit is a part where it all goes through, but kids have actual materials in their hands. They're making the circuit work, and they're talking about and developing the rules for it works when you have a complete circuit. If you don't get a complete circuit, it doesn't work. If all the wires connect to the various parts and pieces, and they start to pull that in, then the then the students can go back and draw it, which then hits that interpreting and communicate, draw a complete circuit, or being able to recognize pictures, well, will this one light or will this one not light? And then working towards developing a switch to work in a particular system. So within one particular activity, ultimately we're asking them to design a switch, but as we're working through the other parts of this, we're getting them to the point where they're hitting all of the different examples through one activity. It's not just sit and get, tell, walk them through, but they're discovering, they're asking questions. And then after they design their switches, you can have, let's just say, five different groups within a classroom. They've all designed their switches. Then you would have them look at each particular one and talk about the differences between them. What makes this one work? What makes this one better? If you're going to use it in a particular situation and give them a scenario, have them talk about the pros and cons of using all of these systems that work. So you're taking it a little bit further. They're really delving in deeply to the content and actually putting it into a real world application. This also introduces another portion of the model curriculum, which is the visions into practice in the classroom examples. The expectations for learning are the cognitive demands, which we just walked through, those four different areas. We've provided examples of those cognitive demands in the visions into practice. These are idea starters, and this is the area of the model curriculum that will expand in time. This is the area that we want teachers to start to utilize some of the ideas that they see here. Teachers will also have a wealth of tools in their own treasure chest that they can bring to the table and add to the conversation as they start to think about implementing the model curriculum and the revised standards. So there are idea starters. They're not mandatory, but we would like teachers to start using this and also giving us feedback on this. What's working, what's not working, or what can we add to this particular section to make it richer? As you read through the visions into practice, there might be things that are familiar and there might be things that are not so familiar. We have also provided within the model curriculum instructional strategies and resources, which give you a variety of resources to pull upon for instruction. You'll see um, teacher background knowledge for particular content, if it's particularly new to the grade level or um, a new way of thinking about a particular scientific concept. You'll find the research behind the methodology that is promoted in the document and gives you an opportunity to go back to the original source, original source via a hyperlink, which will take you right there so that you can read and understand what decisions were made and why. 
It also has activities on there that will help to promote some of the things that you find in the visions into practice. You will also find resources that have databases, which students can then analyze and look at. If you go to the um, illustration we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, the MP4 on the seventh grade example, that takes you to an actual satellite which gets information about the thermal um, currents on the Earth's surface showing you real-time live data that students can use and talk about as they're thinking about and learning about various concepts. So that's the type of information that you'll find. Resources to live databases, to webcams, um, to teacher resources for activities. What you will not find under the instructional strategies and resources are lessons. There will not be live lessons or lessons start to finish. There will be ideals for lessons, but not lessons in and of themselves. You'll also find in the model curriculum common misconceptions. This is a very valuable section of the document because it highlights things that students are going to bring to the table. And it also highlights ways for teachers to avoid planting some of these misconceptions. And where there are links, you, you'll see them highlighted in a different color. You'll go there and it'll take you to that source. Or we've just highlighted or mentioned them so that you can think about them as you're doing your instruction to help to bring it to your forefront so that you don't um, um, inadvertently plant some of the misconceptions that we're trying to avoid. There's resources, again, to help in teaching so that these things are not planted where we don't want them. There's also a wonderful resource on the model curriculum for diverse learners in the Universal Design for Learning. This takes you to, this is the front of the web page that the link will take you to, and there's information for all types of students. Remembering that the revised standards and model curriculum were written for all students, so this gives you resources that help you with gifted students, students with um, language barriers, and also students with disabilities. It gives an opportunity to hit a variety of students. And there's a lot of good activities for every kind of student. It's worth taking the time to comb through this research because even though it might be labeled for one particular group of students, you might find that there are some helpful hints that will help all students. The next section of the model curriculum, we talked about the diverse learners, and that's the link to the page I showed prior to this. There's also classroom portals. Most of the portals are populated through the Annenberg Learning.org, which take you through various teachers working through delivering content, walking through their struggles, and actually showing them with live students. There's also um, information, again, on how to teach particular content for some of the content statements. This is another area that we hope to um, add to and bring Ohio teachers to as we move through this process. We want to highlight and showcase in the future Ohio teachers teaching the model curriculum and showing how they do that with Ohio students. And this is another section of the model curriculum that will change and will be upgraded as time goes on. We have an illustration in our model curriculum of the Eye of Integration. And the Eye of Integration is a tool that helps us to pull together a lot of different areas under one umbrella. The seventh grade example shows you an Eye of Integration, but the purpose is to encourage depth, rigor, and the relevancy in Ohio classrooms where you pick a topic and you relate it to all of the other disciplines, so you bring in the social studies and the mathematics and the English language arts and the arts and foreign language connections. You also bring in the universal or the 21st century skills of how do you highlight those as you walk through this illustration. This is the seventh grade example that is posted on the web. 
Um, there's also a blank template on the web because this is a wonderful opportunity for teachers to start to think about instruction in a very global way. So it's not just the isolated silos of math, science, ELA, social studies, but how do you tie it together in a meaningful unit? This is also a wonderful opportunity for teachers across disciplines to talk to one another, to build these units and to build these themes to move forward in a way of making, again, those real-world um, applications because things don't happen in a silo. They are interconnected. Um, Another illustration of how you can do this is in many portions of Ohio, um, wind turbines are being put up, and that has connections across many different areas. If that's going up in your backyard, that provides the interest, so you can talk about, you know, why, why are these wind currents here? How do they affect energy? Are they better energy usage versus fossil fuels? You can talk about the um, environmental impact that has and you tie in biology. So you can do it interdisciplinary, in, intra and interdisciplinary. Um, you talk about um, social studies and how is that impacting the environment? Does it have a, any effect on the, um, the, the real estate in the area? Does it make rates go up or down? And how does all of that come into play? So the example of the eye of integration is one giving you one illustration, but also inviting you to think about what's going on in your own backyard and how you can build your own eyes of integration as we move through this process. Now we're going to move into some of the tools to help you to process between the 2002 and the 2010 documents. One of the tools that we have is the comparative analysis. The comparative analysis takes, is a three-column chart which gives you information that's new to a particular grade, information that's the same in the grade from the 2002 document and the 2010 document, and information that's no longer a focus at grade level. This is important because it gives you an idea of what's moved and how it's moved. But it's only a surface glance. Once you look at the comparative analysis and you see, starting with the middle column, what's the same between those two documents. You're then going to want to go back to the model curriculum and look at the content statement, description, and elaboration. Those three parts will allow you to get a clear picture of what the emphasis, the depth, the rigor of that content now is for that grade level. It is not going to be the same as it was in the 2002 document. If you look at the comparative analysis and you see that the topic is the same, the conversation surrounding the topic will be different. So even though you still might be talking about cells at sixth grade, that sixth grade cell conversation is different in the 2002 document than it is in the 2010 document. So those are the types of things that you're going to want to look at. The comparative analysis goes from pre-K through grade eight. And we've had many questions about when is the high school coming? The comparative analysis as it is can be used for high school because the high school folks can look at the comparative analysis and concentrate on grades six through eight. In the new standards, they will see that a lot of the material at high school is now moved down to the six through the eight grade band. If it's there, that means it's no longer going to be taught at high school, so that helps you to define what's no longer present, which means that the rest of the information has a different focus or it's new. So that's how high school folks can use the comparative analysis. There's not one specifically for high school, but this one can be used to help to inform instruction for high school folks. The other tool is the... Um, crosswalk, which gives you the broad topics, but again, the comparative analysis is really the tool that you want to use. Talked about it earlier, want to 
again, invite you. In a few weeks, we will have a model curriculum survey available. This is going to give you an opportunity to help build those visions into practice sections and also help to build the instructional strategies. As you start to implement the model curriculum, as you start to see things that would be beneficial to this process, we want to hear that from you. We don't want you to keep this a big secret. We want you to share it with us. So if you will go online, eventually it will be on the science homepage within the web page. There will be a link that you can then share that information with us. But as you start to think about what you want to forward and thinking about what is good, that question arises, is this good material? How do I process it? Is it something that's really useful? And as you're doing that, as you're starting to build your own instruction within your district, we've developed a tool to help you with that, the science resource filter, materials filter. And this is a filter that you will use prior to submitting anything to the department that you'd like to see added to the model curriculum, but it's also a tool for you to use internally in your districts to determine is this a good resource. Your, your, your budgets are coming up. You have resources you have to buy. Do you go with this textbook company? Do you go with this kit, this product? This will help you to answer questions, is it relevant? Is it accurate? Is it great appropriate? Is it going to help us to meet the depths of knowledge that are reflected in the cognitive demands that need to be there? It's in a rubric. You'll be able to score your resource or your activity, and based on your score, you'll be able to make decisions. Is this something that we want to move forward with, or is this something that should um, be reconsidered or redone? To kind of recap where we are with things, we've had a lot of information, and we want to recap and then also give you a reflection into the future, and we've also captured some of your questions, and we're going to take a moment to address those. When you think about the revised science standards and model curriculum, the part that informs your instruction and where you need to go and the part that your assessments are going to be based on is the content statements, the descriptions, and the content limits, the content statements, content descriptions, the content elaborations, and the expectations for learning. They have the cognitive demands. Those four parts are what are the meat of the instruction that needs to go forward. Embedded within that, you will find scientific inquiry, engineering and technological design, and science applications with content. The expectations for learning help you to give you a clear-cut illustration of how that might look. It also provides, the model curriculum also provides teaching strategies and resources to help you to make those real-world applications. We want students to experience real science, not made-up scenarios, but things that they can look in their backyard and see the impact and see how it works. This is the meat. This is the focus of the revised standards and model curriculum. What should teachers be doing now? This is the biggest question that we get. Teachers need to become very familiar with the revised standards, and they can use the comparative analysis to help in that balance of I'm responsible for the 2002 for the OAA and the OGT, how do I start preparing for the next generation of assessments? By using the comparative analysis that keeps you in the information that's the same between the two documents. But you need to start teaching the new standards. Try some of the strategies that you see in the examples that have been provided. Continue to teach science with great depth using their inquiry and scientific practices. Make science relevant. Make those real world connections. Have students solve real problems. Have students look at real data. All of those types of activities will help students be successful on whatever assessment comes down the line. Also, teachers need to participate in professional development. There's a lot of new information out there. 
There's a lot of new strategies. When we look at technology and the design process and we look at how to do demonstrating science well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement and teachers can benefit from participating in professional development. The other thing that impacts how we move forward is the next generation of science standards. There's a reluctance to move forward because, well, we've got something new that's coming down the pike. Why should we move forward? The content, the strategies, the skills that are highlighted in the model curriculum are all foreshadowing of what's coming in the next generation of science standards. Teachers need to get started now in working through what are the new expectations going to be. This gives you a bridge to start working towards that next generation of science standards. Ohio is one of the lead states that's been selected to be a part of this process. And there will be, in the near future, an opportunity for a public review of the standards as they move forward. The framework was developed last year, and that's available on the um, Next Generation of Science Standards website, so you can get an idea of what the framework looks like. The standards are being, writ being written based on that framework. There will be a public review of the standards in about a month or so that will be released, and teachers will have an opportunity to see what that looks like. But again, as we're working to where we're going, you have a document that will help you with the instruction now as we start to move forward. Time for questions. Um, Kimberly Mullins has joined us this morning to help us with these questions. Kimberly? Okay, so a lot of questions that we're getting are based on what Kathy just talked about with the national science standards, and I can reiterate what she said. Um, the work that you're doing to increase rigor, to increase um, depth, to allow students to be more in control of their own investigations, all are supported by the work that we're seeing nationally. Um, so moving towards that, even um, though the standards aren't identical, moving towards that goal of incorporating true science practices into the science content is supported through both the state and the national work. So um, using examples from our model curriculum, it's, it's a great way to actually start building rigor into the classroom. Uh, the other thing to just kind of talk about a little bit is um, we're getting some assessment questions asking about what grade bands will be assessed and what end of course exams will be um, included in our in our work and um, right now we don't know the decisions on that have not been made uh, currently our grade bands are k2 three five six eight and then high school at the science uh, in the science uh, curriculum. However, we don't know what the assessments will be. Um, those decisions are still being made here at ODE, so we can't answer those questions. Um, this is Patty Gray. Just want to remind those of you on the call, if you would like to submit a question up in the very far left-hand corner, upper right upper left-hand corner, you will see the word chat and a plus sign. Uh, click on to the plus, you'll have a drop-down box and you can enter your question there. Just wanted to make sure everybody knew that instruction. We are getting questions, so we know you're finding it, but wanted to remind everybody. Okay, sorry. Okay, so some other questions we're getting are about upcoming work and developing new tools, and, and that work is in progress. For example, our, our goal is to have some additional examples posted on our web page, the eye of integration at each grade level, um, developing other kinds of tools that can help align common core standards with the science standards to ensure that those literacy pieces of the common core ELA are represented in our science standards. 
those are all things that are in development currently um, and, and will be added. Remember, the model curriculum document is a, is a fluid document, and so we are going to be adding and updating it on a regular basis um, using some of those um, using some of those um, kinds of examples to assist you. Uh, as I said earlier, we just got a question about the eye of integration. We are in development. We are developing examples of those, but the idea is to use the eye as a tool so that teachers actually develop their own. Um, working with teams of teachers, sitting down and, and having conversations about the eye of integration and how it can be used to have a meaningful project or, or investigation doesn't necessarily have to come from a science point of view. It can be any kind of um, any kind of content in the center of that eye, and so that's something that is also in development. We're developing, hopefully, an interactive eye so that teachers can use this eye as they develop their own units and lesson plans in the classroom. The, um, there's a question about the model curriculum. As it gets updated, they're usually, when they post the updated file, those messages um, show up on the, on the actual file itself, and it'll say what the latest uh, revision date is for that. So the, the, um, the curriculum, model curriculum file, uh, once we start collecting information, and, and updating those. We're going to be reviewing the information that we collect from the field monthly, and then as needed, we will be revising those, those documents um, so that they're always reflecting what we're collecting from the field. Content elaboration and expectation. Are they standing to be used for test item development? So the content, content elaboration, that section of the model curriculum is static. And in science, our learning expectations are our cognitive demands, and so that is also static. Uh, underneath the learning expectations in science, we have classroom examples, also called visions into practice. Those are the areas that would be changing along with the um, instructional strategies and, and resources that are available, as well as misconceptions and things like that. The content statement, the content description, content elaboration, and learning expectations will remain static. Within a week. Within a week. Um, the, the webinar is being recorded. Our hope is that it will be um, posted within this next week. And if you have additional questions, my email is Kathy, C A T H Y, dot Holmes at education dot Ohio dot gov. Kathy.holmes at education.ohio.gov. I thank you for spending your morning with us. Um, certainly, if you want to continue um, putting questions in the chat box, we will keep uh, it open for a while. As we said, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted. We also will be sending you a message either this afternoon or tomorrow with a quick online survey, but we'll also include the link to the resource page on our website for science that many of the resources and materials Kathy discussed today are on. So, oh, anything else? Okay. With that, have a great day. Thank you for joining us, and good luck.